I was invited recently to be in Google's beta test group for its new AI engine, which they call BARD. Knowing this episode of the podcast was all about quantum physics and quantum mechanics, and knowing very little about that subject myself, I decided to put BARD to the test. I requested BARD tell me a joke where the object of the joke is how people do not understand the concept of quantum physics. Here was Bard's response. What do you call a physicist who explains quantum physics to a layman? A miracle worker. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Hello, and welcome to the Reliability Matters podcast. I'm your host, Mike Conrad, and I'll be your guide to all things reliability within the electronics industry. For those of you who are counting, this is episode number 119. On this podcast, we discuss the latest trends and technologies in circuit assembly reliability, as well as providing tips and advice on how to improve the reliability of your products. We talk to industry experts, engineers, and researchers from all over the world sharing their insights and expertise on how to design and assemble reliable circuit assemblies. If you're interested in learning more about the reliability of circuit assemblies, then this is the podcast for you. So subscribe now while you're thinking about it. Hit subscribe and join us on this journey for reliability. So by now, we're all aware of the term quantum physics and quantum mechanics. But if you're anything like me, you may have little understanding of what those terms actually mean. I first met my guest at the SMTA Pan Pacific Symposium in Hawaii just this past January. He was presenting a paper entitled Quantum Technology, a Theoretical Overview of the Possibilities. The more I listened to and watched his presentation, the more I wanted to learn about quantum physics and mechanics. So I selfishly invited him onto my show today so I could learn more and perhaps you can too. My guest today is Dr. James Whitfield. Dr. Whitfield is an associate professor of physics at Dartmouth College. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry and Mathematics from Morehouse University and his PhD in Chemical Physics from Harvard University. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University in New York, Vienna Center for Quantum Science and Technology in Vienna, and Ghent University in Belgium, and he is currently an Amazon visiting academic. And even better than all that, he's my guest today on the Reliability Matters podcast. So... Without any further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. James Whitfield to the show. Well, hello. You survived the joke. <laughs> That's pretty so good. Was, I mean, was Baird, what was Bard um, accurate? Um, sometimes do you feel I mean, a bit like a miracle worker? I mean, I do my best to try and explain things as I understand them, but I've been trying to put together explanations since I got started. And I guess explaining stuff to myself and then to other people. But yeah, I don't know about miracle worker. I mean, you do your best, right? Hope that teaching goes well. <laughs> right. Well, I think in your world, though, um, unlike when you're speaking at a conference like you did in Hawaii in January, um, you know that audience didn't necessarily show up to to learn quantum mechanics to learn about quantum mechanics. They showed up to learn about a lot of things, like it, which I think makes it more challenging for the speaker. You know, because you have to speak to people who who are interested in hearing what you're saying and people who you're, you're part of the, the program, right? You're just part of the program. But um, in in your academic world, you know, all of your students signed up for your class. So you one would assume there's some, you know, inherent level of interest in, in, in the subject uh, or or they're masochists or whatever, you know, <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they knew what they were getting into. So, and, and I assume they, they want to learn more. Um, what drew you to the the whole topic uh, and the whole science of, of quantum technology. Uh, one doesn't yeah. just wake up out of bed one morning at you know nine years old and go, I want to be a you know quantum mechanics physicist you know or, or maybe 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 that does happen. Tell me about your journey and how you got to where you are. Maybe you wake up in your bed maybe not at nine but at 19 just okay. like, should I do 
my life. And you've already been doing math and science. And then I think um, one of the most interesting aspects of, of my career, I think one of the major points was first time I went to grad school and I got a check, my graduate student stipend. And I was just completely, I was so happy. I was so happy. Not even the amount, I don't, I don't remember how much it was. And it wasn't much, but I think it was just very happy that someone's paying me to study. Like, it's just like, you know, this is one of the best things in the world. I just supposed to learn things and I like learning things. I like going deeply into things. And so, you know, having an opportunity to keep learning and learning and learning and then going from one side of the classroom to the other side of the classroom, it's really how I got there. I think for me, it started much younger. Um, you talk about being nine. Um, I really like math and science because it's a very quiet space to work. Um, you know, people talk about meditation and, and praying and things like this. For me, this is close as it gets, or you know, maybe even the same thing, because you're sitting there and I, and I have my mom's old uh, books, it's like her old books from college, and I can go back and do intervals, you know, just to calm down. You know, I'm really emotionally upset, or someone said something to me I didn't like, and I just do an interval. If you don't get it, do the next one. If you don't like get that one, do another one. Right? Just you know very quiet space four plus four has no emotion in it i mean maybe it has some emotion to you but that's personal emotion not thought about what someone said to you last week or whatever it's i really enjoyed that aspect of math i started off pre-med and then i didn't want to be a doctor so i just had a chemistry degree <laughs> and then a math and a chemistry degree and then i went off to grad school and started doing quantum computing um my advisor had just written a paper about quantum computing right before i showed up and um uh, that was the project it put me on, and I've been doing quantum computing, quantum chemistry pretty much ever since. I mean, mix them a lot more things that I really enjoy quantum theory, quantum mechanics. Because there's so many things to bring in from computer science to engineering to um, math and to chemistry and physics. It goes all around. And I really like the ability to kind of look at many different places and still have one grounding topic to stay with at. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm no mathematician, but one thing I really enjoy or even respect about math is it's truth. Math is truth. It, unlike maybe some liberal studies, you know, English and art and, and things like that, that are very subjective. You know, there's, there's a person's truth, which may not be the other person's truth, but in the world of mathematics, it's a universal truth, right? Because two plus two is four to me and two plus two is four to you. And you know, unless someone, you know, is is a little bit nuts and and just doesn't agree with that, um, and, and and can show, you know, can back it up scientifically, uh, it is a universal truth. It never disappoints. And sometimes it's hard to get to that truth, but once we do, we realize that it was there the whole time. You know, we're just discovering it. And, and speaking of discovery, um, this whole quantum field, you know, a uh, 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 topic today seems to be at least from a layman's standpoint, from my standpoint, it seems to be relatively new. You know, I don't think we were studying quantum physics in the 30s, for example, uh, or, or, or maybe we didn't know we were, or we had another term for it, or maybe it was a foundation. But, yeah. um, but we're, we're, you know, it's, it's not like we're discovering something that didn't exist. We're discovering an understanding of something that has existed since the beginning of time um, so, to how much? How much is uh, it in quantum physics and mechanics? Let's we'll just call it kind of quantum technology as a placeholder. How much of what you teach and what you learn is theory, and how much is um, generally accepted? You know, is, is there a percentage of you know? Are we are we ninety nine percent theory and and working to get one percent of the time accepted or Tell me how all that is, if that yeah. question even makes sense to you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think it's a good place to kind of start a conversation about it. Uh, so you mentioned quantum mechanics and rich in the 30s. So around um, the end of the 1800s, around 1900 or so, people realized that, well, there were some claims that physics was done. Everyone solved all the physics problems. <laughs> Just, you know, except a few small, uh, you know, mysterious, whatever, and then this whole mystery is opened up into quantum mechanics writ large. Um, you have this idea of chemistry going back to thinking about molecules and atoms. Um, uh, Ludwig von Boltzmann was a uh, founder of statistical mechanics, and he realized that there had to be quantized particles. Uh, people who do music often see um, quantum 
quantization. So you have the first, you have different harmonics of an instrument, and these are all quantized based on the size of the instrument and the shape of the instrument. Um, and so a lot of these things end up being quantized naturally. And so there's nothing theoretical about it um, in that in that sense. I think what has become new in the last 10, 20, 30 years even is the engineering side of quantum mechanics. It's really being able to take the fact that we understand how atoms and molecules and how these things connect to experiment, how these connect to theory, theory and how the theory connects back to experiment, all these things. Now, can we take those understandings and engineer something? Can we make something out of this? Can we then use these effects to do something interesting? So I think a lot of science starts off with quantifying something, understanding that something's wrong, realizing there's some problem here, and then quantifying what that, what the, what's going on, checking your theory against like, against what you what you predict it to be, improving your theory, and then coming with an experiment, new theory, an experiment, new theory, an experiment. So quantum mechanics is a, a very important interplay between you know what the theory says and what the experiment says, and that's actually how we validate the quantum mechanics. Is a, is a theory that holds a lot of validity. Um, the Nobel Prize last year was around violating inequality um, that Einstein had put forth, or not Einstein had put forth the inequality, but Einstein had put forth the idea that quantum mechanics was not correct. And so proving that it is correct has been a, a small cottage industry for many years that resulted in a Nobel Prize um, last year. So Einstein, which is generally, at least from my perspective, held in high regard scientifically, he was wrong about quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah, profoundly wrong about quantum mechanics. And, and, and it's really interesting because he did some very similar works that really laid the foundation for the mathematics and the understanding of the quantum mechanics and even won his Nobel Prize for quantum. Um, but I think the Bohr-Einstein debates, he was on the losing side of that argument. That's just all the arguments that he had with Bohr and Einstein. I mean, I, he said God doesn't play dice. I mean, probabilities at the heart of quantum mechanics and, and the way that I think about it and, and the way that I you know, try to explain quantum mechanics. So let's start with probability first. And Einstein famously said, God does not play dice. And this, oh, I'm not sure if it's actually his quote, but it's often attributed to him. Um, and this is not the right way to think about quantum mechanics. And he had for his EPR paradox. And again, it was not the right way to think about quantum mechanics. So a lot of things that Einstein, I think, conceptually um, overlooked, I think, is his skill and ability as a physicist did not match his imagination as a philosopher. Not to not to knock anyone too too hard that's sure. running around argue against. Interesting, yeah, interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you a very short question, which will no doubt solicit a very long answer, and it's it's almost an unfair question, but you're in the educational business, so I'm just going to throw it at you anyway. Yeah. Um, and answer the question as if your audience all has a beginner's mindset, you know, <laughs> for my benefit and probably for some of the audience. What is quantum physics slash mechanics? Uh, is there a, a, is one a variation of the other? But let's just kind of back up a little bit and tell me about the whole quantum uh, Great. technology in a in yeah. kind of a layman's term. And, and this is something Baird says, uh, you'll have to be labeled a miracle worker in order to do it. So we're gonna, we're gonna kind of test that theory as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's not so hard to explain, depending on the level that you're interested in. Um, very much so, um, thinking about a car. If you think about a car, there's a lot of details in there. You don't care about if you want to know how what the top speed is. Top speed, you don't care about the uh, you know the injection cam cycles. I know this stuff is important. You know, you just want to know how fast does a car go. And if you don't care about the details, it's one thing. If you do care about the details, maybe you don't care about the car. You want to make sure it's engineered correctly and that the you know, the fuel efficiency is high or whatever. And so quantum mechanics, the same thing. You can zoom out and really care a lot about the details, really get into how this applies to atoms, molecules, solids, nuclear physics, and, you know, how this might understand the world around you. Or you could think, well, how does this affect, you know, my bottom line? How does this affect my engineering? How does this affect what I want to build? And I think more than quantum physics and quantum mechanics, I think the major difference that, that is really coming out now is quantum technology versus quantum mechanics, quantum physics. And I really like, uh, I heard this quote once someone said that their goal was to try to get people from quantum mechanics to quantum engineers. And so I think this is really where a lot of the transitions going on in the industry, where it's a lot more um, companies involved and a lot less academic, well, not less academics, but academics is so important, 
But now there's a lot of companies being involved, investing large amounts of money, not just U.S. government, that are really trying to engineer these devices and create things. So that's the difference between quantum technology, where you're trying to build something, and quantum engineering, or quantum physics, quantum mechanics, where you're thinking about how does this stuff work at all. And I think um, a little bit about quantum mechanics, and the way that I think about quantum mechanics, the way that I like to teach quantum mechanics, and I think all my students will at least start for this a thousand times, but probability first. So if you think about how probability works, it's usually pretty easy to explain to someone who's an engineer, physicist, anybody in the quantitative field, what probability is. You just ask them, you know, 50-50 probability, they get an intuitive sense of what half showing up somewhere, and they can say, you know, two-thirds, and they know fractions, okay, everything's fine. And if you take the principles behind probability and really understand these, that's a very good way to start thinking about how quantum mechanics and so the way that I think about teaching quantum mechanics, and in fact, I'm trying to write up my notes now, um, is, is if you think about how probability functions need to transform, then there's a lot of structure around it to make sure that it stays normalized, make sure that it stays positive, make sure nothing becomes negative. And so you have these couple properties you want to hold on to. And if you start quantum mechanics in the same way, you can start off with something that generalizes the probability function, and you have a probability matrix. Um, and this matrix now has a bunch of properties and you need the eigenvalues to be um, to remain real and, and sum up to one. And the eigenvalue doesn't make any sense. Okay, we zoomed a little too far, but nonetheless, the idea is that there's another object that's like the probability function that you just need to preserve all the properties, and that gives you back the structure of quantum mechanics quite nicely. And then you could think about all the problems that show up in the engineering side, which is sampling, which is around making sure that you maintain what state you want it to be, and it stays that state for as long as possible. That you don't have any, uh, you know, unwanted noise sources changing how the system evolves, changing, you know, the measurement, changing, you know, what's going on inside the system. That if you have probable distribution of red and blue balls and you reach in there and grab out a blue ball, if you did this, it's fine. You get measuring probability distribution. But if uh, a rabbit starts grabbing red balls and a bee flies by, it, you know, takes away a, a blue ball, and you don't know, there's different things in the environment. All these variables, yeah. Yeah, and that's really what happens in quantum when you start trying to engineer quantum mechanics. You start having a lot of things from the environment affect the system that you're trying to control. And so we talk about quantum computing, quantum technologies. It's really about controlling quantum systems, controlling quantum devices, controlling the evolution and behavior of these quantum objects. And this is hard to do because there's other things that will that are interfering with this. You know, if you have an easy access to control this system. Well, someone else can hijack it, not even someone else, but something else. That if you have a laser coming in, you can imagine a light from the room might affect it. The temperature inside of the room might actually be one of the major causes of, of problems. And so a lot of the quantum devices are at cryogenic temperatures. And so this is a whole aspect of it to, to reduce noise and isolate it. Um, at the same time, you have some systems that need to be very high vacuum because the gas particles might hit it. But if a gas particle hits it, it also causes the system to heat up and lose information. And so this whole idea of protecting information is really where you have quantum mechanics intersecting with information theory. You have this quantum information science and quantum technologies coming out of that, thinking about sensors and things like this. They're all applications of the fact that we understand how quanta work. Interesting. We, we seem to have history repeated, at least in one sense. I remember, I believe it was in the 70s, um, the Cray supercomputer. You know, which, by the way, is is basically this now, right? It's basically <laughs> the cell phone. But the the uh, Cray supercomputer was immersed in uh, a cold liquid called fluorinert, uh, which was a non-conductive, you know, dielectric uh, liquid, and they did that to keep it cool. I don't think it was it was you know sub sub like like cryogenic like you're talking about. But uh, those computers generated some heat and they needed to stay cool, so they they dipped them in fluorinert, and um, and Quantum, I know IBM's quantum, so-called quantum computer, I'll say so-called because I have a question on it, um, is also, uh, it is cryogenically operated, right, um, from what I understand, um, but for different reasons, uh, not because, I think in the Cray sense, it wasn't that the heat would give, it would make 2 plus 2, 5. I think in that case, the heat would cause something to melt and catch fire or, you know, uh, or burn up, uh, in other words. Um, that kind of brings me to to this question. I um, I always kind of crack up over 
the latest in science being hijacked by some corporation's marketing department, right? And and I see that right now in artificial intelligence. The term AI seems to have made its way into Madison Avenue, and um, I'm hearing all these commercial products, consumer products, you know, toothbrushes with AI and and et cetera, et cetera. Now maybe there's a sliver of truth to that, if if any. Um, but have you seen the whole the term quantum, whatever quantum mechanics, quantum physics, quantum technology? Have, have you seen evidence of that being commercialized in in, in maybe computing is a good example? Because I've certainly heard of you know quantum quantum computers, uh, and I'm I'm thinking of IBM now, which may totally may truly use quantum technology. I don't know, um, and I. And I've read articles that these, you know, like Chat GPT, you know, is is so powerful it has to be run on quantum computers, and I'm not sure if that's actually accurate either. But what's your take on on how much of the the uh, regular everyday Joe conversation about quantum is is actually what you understand quantum to be? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It makes a lot of sense. There's a lot to say here. I don't know. I'm good. Uh, but hopefully it'll step with any toes here. Um, but yeah, this is perennially a problem, I guess, for every new technology is that you know, the PR is not the engineering department. They just write whatever they want to write. And this has been a problem with quantum computing for a long time. I think going back to um, some of the early announcements by D-Wave many, many, many years ago, um, where they had really oversold what they had created. Um, I think now a lot of the larger businesses are very conservative about what they're saying. So at AWS, I mean, we try to, you know, be the voice of reason um, as much as possible. Uh, but I think a lot of companies, you know, they need to make uh, you need to make their shareholders happy. You have to make your, you know, your Series A, Series B, whatever. You need to get, you know, drum up funding, and so you need the hype to actually maintain the investment. And I think there's a certain aspect of it that's not entirely hype. Um, I think a lot of companies, a lot of news cycles end up hyping things that don't need to be hyped. Um, I think a small experiment to play around with the toy system gets said, well, quantum computers will do a blase blah thing that's, you know, way oversold. Um, in my own personal opinion, I mean, I work on some things that I think will work, but I think a lot of the, even the scientific literature has misleading content and not necessarily misleading because people are trying to be misleading. Sometimes they just don't know, you know. Um, they just, you know, they're new to the field or whatever, and they're going down this route because they can make some progress or, you know, this is at least something that works today. And so there's a lot of things that, um, end up being today's hype. And there's a lot of questions of what's going to survive till tomorrow. And I think, you know, thinking about what the business model will be, how this will actually affect companies, how this will actually play a role in society. Right now, the devices are small, they're noisy. I mean, this is a podcast about reliability. So like, if they're not very reliable, then that's exactly what the whole issue is. And so um, without the devices being at scale, there's really nothing that needs to be said to consumer level. I think also even as a consumer of quantum technology and whether it happens to be a chat GPT or not, it will be cloud computing. Most likely, almost all the companies that are doing quantum computing have enabled um, cloud computing access cloud access to the devices. So people aren't selling the devices as much as they're selling access to the device. Right. And so what you can expect will happen more likely than it being something that shows up at your front door. Rather, it'll be something in the cloud. You know, you ask a question to Alexa or Siri or whatever, and then maybe it runs some quantum computing job or chat GPT. If someone really figures out a way to use quantum computing to speed that up, it wouldn't show up on the consumer side either. It would just, you ask Bard, and Bard tells you something, it, it used a quantum device, didn't use a quantum device. And so I think a lot of this will be very much behind the scenes when it does come to fruition. I think um, a lot of the hype cycles are, you know, like, yeah, people have to make, they have to make their, their investment somewhere or another. But right. <laughs> and, and some but of them may be to drive funding and things like that, right? The the larger, the the grander the promises, the grander the, the, the uh, you know, someone wants to fund it, right? Because it yeah. it will land on their P&L at some point. I, yeah, I think that's just human nature. But it does it does crack me up when I'm aware of a certain technology, not so much quantum, um, but and then I see that 
bounced around in in kind of layman circles and in, in consumer circles it's it's just funny to hear the interpretation it's like that old game of telephone you know you get 10 people in a row and you whisper something into each one's ear and what comes out the other end it's something completely different um were you, I'm using the term quantum physics and quantum mechanics almost interchangeably, which is probably not totally accurate. But what is the difference between quantum physics and quantum mechanics? Is one just a, a, a deeper dive into the other? Or but help me understand that. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing really. I mean, there's okay. Word. Um, right. the, and not, and and maybe to zoom out a little bit, they're just words. Yes, but people use the words to mean certain things. So there's quantum chemistry, there's quantum physics, there's mm. chemical physics, there's physical chemistry, there's, you know, it's a bunch of word soup, you kind of put them in there and then you feel like you want to say quantum mechanics one day. And if you're in the physics department, you say quantum physics. If you're in the chemistry department, you say quantum chemistry. And then if you're, you know, just teaching a class where you call it quantum mechanics and if you want to call it quantum physics, it's, your physics. it's just words, really, at some high level. So the operative <laughs> word is quantum. Quantum is the, is the defining term and then the next one is just the context that that you're defining it in is that that's fair? Pretty, that's that's much fairer than thinking there's something deep differences um okay. i would say that in quantum physics you know a lot of times you think about very much physical protocols you're thinking about how the physics intersects so in a quantum physics textbook you might start off with the atom and how the quantum mechanics of the atom you know dictates a lot of understanding of materials and matters and maybe going to the quantum mechanics of nuclei or maybe go into quantum mechanics of fundamental particles, you can start zooming in. And if you think about quantum chemistry, well, you zoom out. You start off with the atom, and you go to you know multi-atoms, multiple atoms, you start talking about molecules and bonding, and then you start talking about how this affects molecular dynamics. And so you're zooming in and zooming out in different directions. And they just, you know, it's such a bifurcated field that you need different names to kind of say where you're at. So if you say a quantum physics textbook, you expect to talk about physical experiments, you know, talk about the Nobel Prizes in physics, um, more so than Nobel Prizes in chemistry, which are also often driven by quantum mechanics. And so it's not that quantum mechanics ends up you know, being different. It's still, you have to still have the same notion of quanta. You still need the same mathematical framework. You still need the same setup, more or less. And then you just have different applications of that. And you can't put everything in one textbook. So that's why they have different names for different books. But yeah. quantum is the operative part of it, that it's quantized at some level. So I did some research on, you know, to prepare for this conversation and as much as I could. And um, one of the definitions of, of quantum mechanics was, and among other things, uh, understanding the properties of semiconductors. Mm. So, so, okay, that's, there's, that's one application of, of quantum. And then I started thinking, um, and the kind of this paradox appeared in my head, semiconductors don't grow on trees. They're man-made. Semiconductors were made by us, right? Um, and now, all these years later, we have a whole field of science that studies what we have already made, right? So it, it that okay? I'm not quite clear on on that, but let's let's just go with that. Um, the first semiconductor, in its primitive form. Uh, was um, a rectifier, an AC-DC converter, you know, back in 1874. Technically, that was a semiconductor, or at least a very primitive version of a semiconductor. Um, decades later, Bell Laboratories invented the point-to-point uh, -point transistor, 1947. Arguably, it's, it's got its roots in semiconductor technology. And Shockley uh, invented the uh, junction transistor in 1948. So semiconductor... It, uh, technology in its in, in some form or another, even primitive, have been around for over a hundred years, um, and now we have a science that is studying um, the technology that has been around in one form or another for more than a hundred years. Uh, is, is that is that an accurate interpretation? And if so, uh, is it common for us humans to invent something? and then spend centuries potentially studying um, what we've invented to understand how it works. It seems to me if I invent a, a wheel that turns, I kind of know how it works because I invented it, right? But I, I'm oh, super oversimplifying that question, but yeah. but uh, just to make a point. Um, so comment Maybe on that I, if you if would. Yeah, I can comment on that. I think I can comment um, pretty, pretty uh, extensively on that. So I guess 
Um, if I understood your your kind of your your question, you're saying semiconductors have been around for over a hundred years, but really semiconductors have been around since you know, say it, right? Silicon, all these sorts of things. True. Well, the things that don't conduct super well are semiconductors, right? If it's a yeah. conductor, well, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't conduct at all. Semiconductors somewhere in between. Um, and the whole idea of semiconductor technology is that we can control how much it does and does not conduct. And this is doping and all these different uh, different types of junctions and you have the N and the P junction and you have different types of uh, gallium arsenic and you have these different ways of combining semiconductors to make technology out of it. Uh, so it's not just that we have semiconductors. We had semiconductors just because some things conduct well, some things don't and there's something in between and that's what semiconductors are. But making that into technology and really having that as an industry, being able to manufacture, fabricate, you know, cut, design, and do combine different types of semiconductors really where the technology comes in. And I think uh, if you think about something like inventing a wheel, right, there's all sorts of technology around wheels. You know, what kind of rubber we use, what kind of uh, wheelbase it is, whether you use allium, uh, different alloys for the wheel spokes. And I don't know, it's an engineering podcast. You guys must know much more about how to engineer a wheel, but people still study engineering of wheels that, you know, I don't think it's, it's not surprising that people go deeper and deeper and deeper into it. I think one of the interesting things about quantum mechanics is I teach a course called solid state physics where we go through the quantum mechanics of, you know, conducting semiconductors, you know, talk about an electron, what's well, quantized electricity. And then you think about how the electron behaves and you have you know, it's its cousin, the hole, which is a missing electron. And you have these sort of things and how they actually the dynamics are as individual particles and as collective particles, the behavior thereof. And that's where you get the quantum mechanics explaining what's going on physically. Even if you made a semiconductor or you made you know, um, some semiconductor rectifier. Well, how does it work? You know, what are the details behind this? What kind of semiconductor did you use? Did you use a semiconductor that's dope? Did you use a pure semiconductor? Um, you know, not pure intrinsic semiconductor or extrinsic semiconductor. So there's different types of ways of thinking about how do we actually engineer, control, devise, understand, or why did it's hundred years ago, right? So you think about Newton wrote down the the physical laws for how the planets moved when he, he wrote down his uh, equations. Uh, 1600s or so been studying them ever since right still teach Newton's three laws of mechanics right and so it's not that you stop studying things just because you made them what's yeah no that, that that makes a lot of sense it's uh um and you're right there are plenty of examples of the study of existing technologies to expand its application or improve its use i guess that's the, the reason computers are faster today and that's the reason Phones are smaller today, and that's all of that, right? It's it's a uh, evolution, I guess. Yeah. Uh, maybe revolution was the discovery of turning sand into semiconductors, and then evolution is what we're going through and all the various uh, progressions of it. Um, for the person in the electronic, most of my audience is in the electronic assembly space. You know, we're we're assembling circuit boards and putting them mm -hmm. in things and and hoping they don't fail. Um, in your in your world, in your in your experience and opinion, what can we expect to see in the future that will think, lock our world as a result of the study of of, of quantum technologies? I think it's a really interesting um, question. There, um, what? we'll see in the future what you see now so right now there's already tons of quantum mechanics so everything i remember going to your talk at the um at the uh conference in hawaii and you talked about uh you talked about chemical reactions you know talking about diffusion concepts and these are all quantum mechanical concepts right um these these things have underlying quantum mechanics as to why they're true you know why did this reaction proceed well there's some electronic structure there's some nuclear behavior there's some interaction with the electron and wave functions, and then these things find it more energetically favorable to be in one form or the other. And whether it's polar or nonpolar, you look at the wave function and whether the distribution of charges are, you know, uh, asymmetric or not. And so this ends up being the underlying reason why these things are true. But if you don't care about the underlying reason, it's like driving a car again. You know, you just drive the car and you don't really worry right. about all those of it. And I think for the long term, distant future um in the same way the components of a transistor are very much you know isolated from the person who's making the 
making the uh, you know making the the the, um, the board. You know, they don't need to go in and do the wiring on every single part. You know, they have them in, you know, IC, sure how it, and we'll put them in and, you know, solder it on or whatever. And the same thing I think will eventually be true if quantum mechanics gets integrated far enough that then you have some piece of a chip that you just, you know, fabricate on the board. And that might be, you know, 100 years from now. Uh, I don't know if it's that long, but, you know, to really have miniaturized the point where it's integrated circuits that you're putting onto a board. You know, we're very, very far away from that as far as quantum technology goes. But I think that, you know, at some point it has to become an engineering problem. When it's an engineering problem, you want everything to be encapsulated to different silos of problems that you solve. You know, solve the the resistor problem and put it this little, you know, integrated circuit component and then you can put it into your whatever you want to put it into. And so when we start building up quantum devices the same way, I think that'll be part of what it has to become just for it to become, a, you know, engineering solution. Um, I think that's where the distant future is. And I think right now we're still trying to get, you know, anything to work. And I think, you know, I think in many ways, the quantum mechanics is already there. If you're dealing with, you know, chemical reactions or dealing with, you know, uh, you know, electricity and magnetism, I mean, all these things all require quantum mechanics in, in many ways. And it, it maybe don't need to use quantum mechanics at all times, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, it's it's there in the background, whether we recognize it or not. Like sand, we've always had semiconductor materials. We just didn't know how to put them together. Exactly. Uh, I've read that some of the challenges uh, of using quantum mechanics in the electronics industry include the difficulty of controlling quantum systems, uh, the need for new materials and devices, the need for new manufacturing methods. Um, do, you, do you agree with those challenges? And if so, how are we going to overcome that? Uh, I think circling back to something you said earlier about the devices that uh, are cryogenically cooled um, and the difference between, you know, cryogenically cooling uh, or not cryogen, but cooling um, a CPU that's heating up as a result of doing processing. Uh, for the quantum computing and a lot of the technologies that, that uh, are being pursued around superconductivity, superconductivity requires very cold temperature for the resistance to basically drop to effectively zero. And then you have a lot of other properties that come in those properties that come in and you can exploit for quantum mechanical computing purposes. Um, and what I think uh, a lot of people working on as far as material science goes is getting high temperature superconductors. So if you got high room temperature superconductivity, well then great, we can make room temperature quantum objects that we can then control or otherwise manipulate. And hopefully then that could be something to put in your pocket, right? Integrates directly into semiconductor technology. And so some some places and some companies are pursuing things that are quantum mechanical, but already integrated in semiconductor technology so that it can be scaled up almost immediately. Uh, but the whole name of the game is really around, really around, around that. Interesting. How do you think quantum technologies will land in products that everyday people, maybe outside of our world, outside of your world and my world of engineering, education will will see it you know what what do you what's you know I, I remember in the 60s i used to love popular mechanics and popular science magazines you know I, I couldn't afford to buy them but i would go to the drugstore and and look through the magazines and and read all the articles i could and they promised us flying cars by the year <laughs> 2000 you year 2000 was the benchmark of when all these you know futuristic things were, were going to come to fruition and they promised us flying cars among other things, and robots in the house, and, and we do have some of that. But um, what's your kind of uh, nirvana in terms of the application of all of this study and all of this uh, science? Where do you think it's going to land on, on civilization, and how do you think it will benefit uh, society and, and us humans? So zooming uh, out, I guess, to the beginning of our conversation around quantum technology, so what is quantum technology? I mean, this is really where you can get into marketing from the beginning, right? Like, you know, like quantum no. versus quantum technology versus quantum physics versus quantum chemistry. They're all just words, right? There's not, there's no real, you know, there's no meat behind the words. I mean, there's meat behind the words, and the way that the user's using it, but there's not an established definition of what these things are. And so you say quantum technology, in many ways, you can't build a semiconductor device at nanoscale you know, fabrication without using quantum mechanics. So technically it's quantum technology, depending on how you define these things. 
I think one of the most interesting ways that quantum mechanics intersects people's day-to-day -day lives is in atomic clocks. This is really beautiful physics and this really beautiful quantum mechanics. Um, and it's really interesting to think about how time works. These guys measure time so precisely that the concept of now does not even make sense neurologically because the speed at which neurons fire, <laughs> you're thinking about time scales that are far below the speed at which potassium ions go out of a channel, right? So there's no concept of thought at that speed that they are able to record and track time. It's really amazing. Nice. By the time you think of now, it's already history, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's simultaneous. Now is almost simultaneously history. It's crazy. I mean, it, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm still, I'm still like flabbergasted by the concept of relativity. <laughs> like, just, I mean, I know I'm a physicist at all, but like, still very hard to wrap my mind around like things happening at the same time. It's just shift point of view, and now they're happening at different. You know, it's just, it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Um, but you know, they're measuring time at that scale. But these questions become relevant. You know, so the time dilation was reading an article the other day, and they're talking about keeping track with time on the moon. They keep track of time so well that time is actually different on the moon than on the earth because of the difference in gravitational potential. And so, right, you know, gravity and time are, are interrelated. Yeah. yeah. That's an Einstein thing, right? Exactly. It is indeed. And, and, and so, when you have quantum mechanics giving you sensing capabilities, you know, understanding what's going on well enough to engineer something better to, you know, fabricate at a smaller scale, then in some sense, it's all fun thing. Well, like I said, I mean, if you're using the principles behind it, you know, you're using chemistry, well, it's quantum chemistry because it's quantum, it's electrons involved and atoms and molecules that, you know, where you draw the line between what's quantum technology and what's just technology. It's not entirely arbitrary. When people talk about quantum technology, they're talking about not just using quantum mechanics as a beats to an end to generate something you already had at the larger scale and just try to spin it down, but really thinking about how do I use um, quantum mechanics coherence of quantum systems as a resource. And that's really we get to quantum computing and quantum technology. But it, when will they see it? I mean, in your cell phone, right? Can you imagine having a sensor that relies on some quantum mechanical property? I mean, arguably, you might already have quantum technology in your pocket. Whether or not you call that quantum technology, if that's just sensing, you know, it's up to you. Interesting. Um, I have some university students who claim to listen to this show. And um, what, if if there's a, a person entering university and they have an interest in quantum theories, quantum technology, what would be your best advice for them um, in terms of maybe undergrad or, or prep? What, yeah. what, do you, what do you tell emerging students that express an interest in what you teach? Um, I don't know what level of university your students are, but I, get, I would say for quantum computing, and what I give as advice to most people about graduate school, um, more so than undergrad. Undergrads, I mean, do whatever. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters, but you can apply for a job at with almost any degree. As long as you have, you know, some calculus and, you know, differential equations, what's the difference? You're an English major. I mean, you can write well. <laughs> if you know the math and science, you get to work, right? And it's not much of a, of a big difference. I think um, my advice would be, yeah, get your technical skills together. This is one of the major problems that you have as an undergrad anyways. Um, is that if you didn't take the time to learn calculus one, two, and three, you're going to be out of a lot of conversations that we can't have any further. And that's because calculus one, two, and three and differential equations is true, whether you're biology, chemistry, physics, whatever, you have to take the calculus sequence and you're scientist. I mean, not because of that, but now you're able to go and decide later, I want to know more about this, I want to know more about that. But if you don't have the foundation behind it, it's very hard for someone to start teaching it. Um, I think more of the advanced degree students in quantum technology. So if people come to my research group and they say, oh, I want to do a PhD in quantum technology because I want a job. So that's the wrong reason to do a PhD altogether. Like you shouldn't do PhDs for job purposes. Go get a master's degree, you know, do some online certificates if you want a job. But if you want to learn something deeply, pick something you're really engaged with, really enjoy and go enjoy it. That's what the whole entire PhD game is. is to get, you know, four or five years to close out everything else. You have to worry about funding. Don't have to worry about, you know, the newspaper or whatever. Just sit here and here's as many books as you can get through in the next five years. Come back and tell me something interesting. And that's your job as a graduate student. And I think that's really around picking something you're passionate about. For me, I got into quantum computing, quantum mechanics, because someone gave me a book, Milson Chuang's book, and I started reading it. And I just, you know, 
kept going. And there wasn't really anything else. I really enjoyed it. I liked linear algebra. I liked, you know, the aspect of quantum mechanics that I had learned from chemistry. And then just kind of bringing that more and more to center stage inside my mind and studying deeper and deeper was how I got into it. And not because there was a bunch of companies involved or anything of the math and nature. So I think the companies came many, many, you know, many, many years after I'd started studying quantum mechanics. That, you know, maybe D-Wave was around at the beginning, but other than that, there was not a huge industry. You know, there was no large corporations that were involved in sudden quantum computing when I started. And you got to do something you love. I think that's really the right way to think about how to go and to study something. And if you do something you love, well, you can be employed in many ways. And I think whether it's in quantum industry or whatever comes after or AI or whatever, you need the skills and training to be there. Knowing statistics well will put you in a good position to you know, contribute to ML or contribute to psychology or to whatever else you want to do. So I think as an undergrad, you know, get your background together. Yeah, good advice. I was, what, what, what piece of advice for all yeah. undergraduates? Up? One course I think everyone should take is computer science, you know, just basic programming. I think that, you know, it's, it's past the point and it's so simplified that everyone should know a little bit of programming. Like everyone knows how to write in English. Yeah. I, I, I'm a huge believer in that, and I would, I would actually bring that into elementary school. I think learning to code, I learned to code when I was in high school, and it was you know basic back then, but I used to write games that could be played on a teletype machine. We didn't have monitors back then. You know, we, we, we phoned in to the mainframe computer at the school district, and we had a, a, you know, a handheld phone, and then we stuck the phone into this suction cup device and that was the modem and um and we had a teletype our our user interface was a teletype machine and it was you know so it was just rows of type text and but i i learned to write code and and then advance 15 years or or more after that i started a company you know, which i still own today 31 years later and the early days, you know, I, we, we, we are an equipment manufacturer and the early machines used to run on software. You know, we had controllers, programmable controllers, and they, uh, the, the language of choice for those controllers was a, was a dialect of basic. And I remember like, I know basic, I remember that from high school. Right. And, and, um, I wrote all the code for our, our machines the first few years. And, but, but I do think that if we teach young people and I say young, I'm talking about elementary school, uh, preteens, if we teach them simple coding, I think that teaches someone how to think analytically. It teaches them how to problem solve because life is full of if then statements, if then else, right? If this is the case, we do this or that else, this, it, I think it, it really, uh, to me, it helped me think analytically. It helped me problem solve. And when I was deep in my coding world, you know, when we were doing our big massive coding events and I would go to the office for like three days straight and not go home and just, just sit and code. <laughs> um, I, I would, I remember thinking, you know, I would go to the grocery store to pick up some Diet Coke or something. And, and, and I remember, I, it, it's hard to describe, but I would think of what I'm doing as if I was writing code. You know, yeah. go down this aisle. If it's not here, else go to that aisle. And I had to stop myself. I had to like slap my face and go, okay, I'm not writing code right now. I don't need to think in, in terms of code blocks, right? But but I did. And I don't know. I, I just think your advice is, is amazing for, you know, uh, university level students. But I think that even sooner, you know, get kids exposed. I think learning how to code or at least the concept of coding is just as important as mathematics and science in, in um So I, I would put coding in the English side of things much more than in the math and science side of things. I think your, your story, I think, is really cool because when I think of computers, I think back to Turing, Alan Turing. Um, he wrote yes. it for about the Turing machines, and he was not thinking about digital devices. He was thinking about a person who had a pencil and paper and how it gives instructions to follow to to some procedure. How do you add large numbers? Well, here's a procedure you follow. And you can imagine this is exactly how teachers could teach students. I mean, it's not a very fun way to teach, you know, first carry the wood. Okay. Right. To add right. column here and like erase it. And like you could walk someone through the procedures for adding large numbers as a Turing program. And that would be for someone to know. Um, I think it's a terrible way to teach, but <laughs> you know, the concept is that 
you're absolutely right. As a person, you need to make some procedure for how you're going to solve a problem. You know, you need to do this first, second, third. What's the most efficient way to get there? And so I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I like uh, this coding language, Scratch. My daughter uses Scratch. Um, and this is a really cool programming language. All the if statements, the statements are all like little blocks fit into the box. So you, you can't do the syntax wrong because of the shapes. Yeah. It's a, it's a very nice introduction. It's a, good, it's a graphical language as opposed to just the strings of text, right? It, it, so the, the text is in graphical format. So yeah. if they has like a little bracket with an if react yeah. at the top and a then at the bottom and yeah. a little space to put code that fits in between those little sections. Yeah. So it's all, all like, you know, very intuitive and I like it because it's a nice way to kind of get started. I mean, I also learned, I learned basic as a kid too. Um, and I think with basic, the fun, like full story about it is that it was made at Dartmouth. Um, so this is one of the, uh, one of the fun facts about basic. So, um, yeah, I learned it. My dad, my dad really loved computers when I was a kid and he'd be you know, all sorts of computing devices. And I didn't realize until I was an adult that he got us all in video game systems so he could see how the technology was progressing too. But like, yeah, I mean, I just, I made also, made a chicken walk. My big accomplishment for the summer is like a little yellow blob, another yellow blob, and an orange triangle for a beak. It's orange uh, like the you know, early animator. Yeah, exactly. I was like, cool. I got a graphics. Let me make an animation. Oh, that's cool. Very good. And last question. We're about out of time, but um, time flies when we're, when we're talking quantum. Um, the um, two things affect time: gravity and recording a podcast. I think. Okay. Uh, I think there's a theory in there somewhere that, that someone will, will discover. Uh, and coding time. Uh, when you're coding, time stands still, right? My wife would, would, would uh, you know, say, you know, no rush, but when do you think you'll be done? Oh, 20 minutes. And then like an hour and 45 minutes later, you know, she'd come and go, are you done? I said, I said 20 minutes. She goes, well, that was an hour and a half ago. <laughs> you just lose track of time. Um, Why does 3.14 times whatever my estimate is? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> My wife calls it software time or, or and frequently mic time. Um, if, if the, if quantum X fill in the blank, quantum technology, the study of quantum, uh, whatever were an iceberg, how much of that iceberg is above the water and how much is still yet to discover? Uh, that's a great question. I, I guess for a very high level philosophical, you know, go f have fun on Wikipedia after you finish this podcast point of view on it is uh, there's this whole matter um, in physics, very much like I mentioned the route right of the turn of the century, um, 1800s, in the 1800s, started 1900s, people thought almost everything's done. It's very clear what the principles are, but there's some small mysteries that people haven't solved. And I think now we're at the same place in science with different mysteries. Um, this whole concept of dark matter is really amazing and really interesting. And I think, you know, there's a lot of questions from an astronomical point of view of what that is. But in the same way that a lot of astronomical questions were addressed, in fact, we talked about Einstein several times, but relativity is how we solve um, Mercury's uh, orbit. It's very hard to compute, but you need to take into account relativity to do it correctly. Um, and I decided to figure this out, and he's, but this is a terrestrial problem, you know, terrestrial theory about the speed of light, the rate constant, and you extrapolate and it starts to tell you something about space. And I think that'll be really where quantum mechanics is still missing. There's a huge problem with how quantum mechanics treats time. Um, maybe not huge, but there's a problem with how quantum mechanics treats time. And this means that there's some real questions about how general relativity and quantum mechanics mesh back together. And this, I think, if you do it right, should also address this dark matter problem. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not a dark matter researcher, but this is where I think there's a lot of opportunity in all forms of science that if anyone figures something out and they figure the whole thing out, there's got to be like a missing puzzle piece. We put it in and it'll all click. Like the theory of relativity is really nice because it's not super complicated. I mean, yes, it is complicated, but the core of the idea is like a missing puzzle piece. And you have to extrapolate the puzzle piece out put it everywhere it goes, but you got to get that puzzle piece first, like understanding quantum mechanics in the first place. Okay, cool. I understand quantum mechanics looks like this. Well, how do I understand atoms, molecules, semiconductor technology, you know, fabrication, everything, right? How do I understand, you know, reactions, all these things from quantum mechanics. And I think we're going to have to find something that's missing puzzle piece about dark matter, dark energy, 
and I have no idea what it will be, but I think the study of quantum mechanics at some point will hit pay dirt or, you know, studying relativity also hits pay dirt or whatever. The studying these things at some point has to come back together to make you know, mm. the whole thing make sense. Yeah. So. Excellent. So we're seeing quite literally the, the or, or metaphorically anyway, the tip of the iceberg. Right yeah. I mean, there's, there's always more science. There's always more science. I think that's the fun part about science. You can't be done. I don't care Chad GPT or not. Like we're still going to have scientists needed. You know, there'll always be questions and mysteries that we want to know more about. Sure. And even if Chat GPT or something like that is is what, you know, the the, the future has been promised it uh, it to be, um, it then will reveal things that will require more study and things like that. Yep. Right. That's it, it will reveal the whatever then version of sand. It's always been here and we're just discovering like, oh my God, this could be used for X or Y or, or whatever. And then yep. Someone will come up with a theory on that, which will be proved or disproved and argued about for the next century, and and it's wash, rinse, repeat, right? It's just yeah. it'll just happen. Yeah, excellent. Well, um, Dr. James Whitfield, Professor Dartmouth, among many other things that you do, thank you so much for your generosity, uh, for sitting down for the last hour, a little over an hour, uh, with me and and my my uh, uh, audience and talking about this fascinating subject. I'm envious of, of what you get to do because, um, you know, A, you get to teach students, which, you know, they're, they're my favorite group of people to speak to. And, um, and it's just such a fascinating, fluid subject. You're teaching in real time as the evolution is being discovered. And, and you know, so what you teach today could be quite different than what you teach next year because more is being discovered. So you are actually in a kind of a unique and enviable position of learning and teaching kind of simultaneously, because it's not like you're teaching plain old mathematics where, where the rules just kind of tend not to change, right? Um, methods may change, but the rules are basically the same. You're teaching something that we're still discovering. So uh, that's, uh, to me, that's that's quite remarkable. So, thank you for sharing all that information with me and my audience. I really appreciate thank you for on the show. I'm really, really happy to take the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. It's, thank you again for for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Our episodes have been downloaded more than thirty five thousand times. That just amazes me, and I remain ever grateful for your support and encouragement. Don't miss an episode. You can subscribe to Reliability Matters on pretty much any of your favorite podcast apps. Or if you'd prefer to watch the podcast, then you can view it on the Reliability Matters YouTube channel. And while you're there, be sure and click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. And a special thank you to our friends and colleagues at Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at PCBChat.com and Ascendo Reliability at Reliability.fm for syndicating the show. Thanks also for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. You can send questions and episode suggestions to my email address, which is Mike at MikeConrad.com. Just remember, that's Conrad with a K. Once again, thanks for listening or watching. Until I see you again, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.